Hey, it's Jason Snell sitting in for Leo on this MacBreak Weekly. Oh, there's so much. There's new MacBook Airs. Apple is doing weird stuff in Europe. The Vision Pro got some updates, and, you know, we're still going to talk about it because Leo's not here. Haha, we can talk about the Vision Pro. Apple's going to do a bunch of ads in Apple TV Plus, maybe. All that and more coming up next on MacBreak Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 912 for March 12th, 2024. MacBook Air Heritage Club. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Rocket Money. Did you know that nearly 75% of everybody have subscriptions they've forgotten about? You, you have any subscriptions? You don't even know you got them? I had a ton. In fact, just the other day, I got a bill for $300 from WordPress. I haven't used WordPress in years. I guess I'd just forgotten about it. Well, Rocket Money saved me. They've saved me again and again. When I first started using Rocket Money, I couldn't believe how many subscriptions I was paying for every month. I mean, there are just a ton of them between streaming services and fitness apps and delivery services and on and on and on. It's never ending. But thanks to Rocket Money, I can see those subscriptions and I don't waste money on the ones I forgot anymore. Rocket Money was able to cancel that WordPress subscription with just a few taps. Made it very simple for me. You know, I can go on and on. There was a political campaign contribution I made back in, I think it was the last election. What was that, 2022? And it w I didn't realize it was an ongoing recurring subscription. Rocket Money found it, helped me cancel it like that. I love Rocket Money. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It also monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills so you can grow your savings. It does it all. See all your subscriptions in one place. And if you see something you don't remember or you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel with just a few taps. They'll deal with the customer service for you so you don't have to. Rocket Money has more than 5 million users. It's no wonder. And they've saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions. A lot of them mine. Saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash MacBreak. That's rocketmoney.com slash MacBreak. Rocketmoney.com slash MacBreak. Welcome back to Mac Break Weekly. It's me, not Leo. Uh, I'm Jason Snell. I'm on this podcast every week. Don't you recognize me? But I'm in Leo's chair because Leo is on vacation. And we're going to do an episode of Mac Break Weekly. We're joined by the usual suspects. Plus one. Let me introduce the usual suspects first. What they're suspected of, I leave to you, our loyal viewers. Andy Anatko is here. Noted, beloved technology columnist and writer. And uh, he appears regularly on GBH in Boston. Hi, Andy. Hello, Jason. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't come out and say this, but there's a reason why I'm technically flagged in Liberia and I'm not technically a United States columnist, uh, but we'll leave that for the <laughs> for, for the EU. To talk I think it's because you get away from taxes, right? Isn't that if you're if you flag under the flag of a different country, then you don't have to pay any shipping taxes. Is that? And it's annoying because, like, if I if when I do my weekly shopping, I have to make a stop in an out in a, in a port outside of the yes, United States that's just right. to get some buttermilk. You have to go out to it's Bermuda like, and then big? come back. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's un it's unhelpful. Uh, also wanted in some jurisdictions, but not here. I mean, no. I mean, we want you to be here. You're not just never mind. It's Alex Lindsay. <laughs> Hi, Alex. <laughs> I said usual suspects. Like all I can think of was hand me the keys. Anyway, so um. <laughs> Uh, so not that I've seen the movie a couple times. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, it's good to be here. It's good to Welcome. have you as usual. And our plus one, because Leo is our minus one, which is why there's a whole line of succession thing that happens. I photoshopped some pictures of me with my family in order to try to blur the waters a little bit about this. Uh, but let's not get into that right now. It is my uh, colleague, longtime colleague and compatriot, co-Macworld columnist and Six Colors collaborator, along with many podcasts. And I mean, if I'm here, of course, Dan Morin's going to be here. Hi, Dan. Hi, I'm contractually obligated to be here. I will say nothing. Uh, I'll just hold up a newspaper with today's date. All right. And <laughs> do we have newspapers still? Do we still do that? Is that still a thing? What do you um, hold up now? A phone? I don't know. Can, can, can I say it's really suspicious? I, I would not have suspected, but the fact that you cut your hair so close so that no, so that nobody could see, like if there's a paste oh, job, the, yeah. the, the, the use of the clone tool. Now I'm kind of worried. 
I also appreciate that Alex and Andy and I have dressed in our primary RGB colors today. I think <laughs> oh, it provides so a nice the wiggles degree or the Teletubbies. Of, <laughs> the right. Teletubbies of tech. Hot potato. Hot potato. <laughs> potato, potato, potato. Uh, let's talk about everybody's favorite subject, which is regulations in Europe. <laughs> It's a fascinating story, though. So, of course, the DMA has gone into effect, the Digital Markets Act, I believe it's called. Um, we just know it as the DMA. You know it. You love it. You can't live without it. And it means that Apple has to do things that Apple, quite frankly, does not want to do. But it has to do them because it's the law in the European Union. And we've had a lot of really interesting things happen in the last week. Boy, I mean, I'm underselling it. <laughs> um, a lot, a rhubarb, lot has happened. Rhubarb, rhubarb. A lot has happened, including... Uh, a whole thing between Phil Schiller, who, uh, although he is now an Apple fellow and has no no clear title, he is still in charge of things, including apparently the App Store, and uh, had an email exchange with Tim Sweeney from Epic Games uh, in which Phil Schiller said, oh, I see you registered an account to be in the store in Europe, uh, but we don't trust you because you pulled uh, you pulled a a scheme earlier in the app store and did something you weren't supposed to do. And we kicked you out. I need you to reassure me that you're not going to break the rules and in writing. And Tim Sweeney wrote back and said, I give you my assurance. It absolutely, we will follow the rules. We are in this to follow the rules and do what we want to do. And, uh, and we can provide you anything else that you would like in terms of reassurance. Um, but of course, meanwhile, Tim Sweeney, was still doing what he does, which is criticize Apple's policies, which is sort of one of the reasons we've gotten to this point. And then Apple apparently then sent him an email and said, oh, because you were mean to us on Twitter, you're banned. Um, <laughs> and and it sounds like I'm, I'm uh, making light of this. That's pretty much what happened. So not... <sighs> great. I, Not great. I, I like yeah. your characterization of Phil Schiller as a cantankerous high school principal from a 1980s <laughs> <Yep>. movie. <laughs> ah, you and your hijinks, Sweeney. It's detention yeah. with He's you. He's basically Strickland, uh, Strickland from Back to the Future. Yeah, exactly. From and, Back and, to the Future. And, and, and also like the EU as like Calvin's mom from Calvin and Hobbes is saying, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're, we're kind of paying close attention to your relationships with people who choose to not use your app store. And if you ban people for reasons that don't involve actual buccaneering i think that we're probably gonna have you write us another check so stand down yeah, have and, a cookie and, get and, your sh blood sugar back up <laughs> back and, away from the keyboard and and the real issue is, is the eu is doing this because the united the united states courts basically gave apple the okay because of the, what had happened earlier right. with epic the apple was cleared to ban them if they wanted to <laughs> you know? yeah. so yeah, this is a difference of opinion between apple courts and the eu um, you know, as far I mean, not Apple courts, but US or are courts, they? Um, but yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or they are they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, so I think that you know it'll be really interesting to see how this crossover happens between you know, kind of chaos in the EU for a little while, and maybe maybe forever, but maybe only for six months or so, and it settles in, and it proves that it wasn't that big of a deal, and and yeah. and then and then we all move forward, or it'll prove that it is it's a it's a market that's large enough that if it was a mistake. We'll know it. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So What's and it? so and so and, and and that's great for us as as consumers. We get to watch yeah. them, you know, uh take all the the arrows first and and see and see what what it looks like, you know, and see and so so it's either gonna work out well or it's gonna be, you know, kind of a um it, it may not it could be somewhere in between where it's just really just messed up. Um we we end up with a lot of things like this, especially when regulators get involved. So yeah. um so we, where things are just kind of just a munge of mess. You know, nothing's horrible, nothing's great. It's just messy, you know. And so so you know, I think there's a high probability that will happen. Um I but I also think that it might turn out that it's just no one's really using the apps or no one really cares or people are using them and it's not a problem. And so we'll, you know, we we get to watch all of that in a micro cause them instead of the whole world which is i think great yeah I and mean, we're gonna the, the, the people started having to comply on march 7th they've had plenty of time to figure out what they're going to do but i think the every single stakeholder in this has kind of agreed that 
there is, these are brand new laws. Compliance is going to be a little bit fuzzy for a while. And a lot of it is not simply Apple or anybody else just, you know, sticking up a finger in the, in the face of the EU saying, well, we're going to do this in the minimum way possible. Of course they're going to, but they're, they're trying to do it now in the minimum way legally possible. And we don't know what those borders are. I thought it was kind of interesting that the EU is actually on March 18th. They're holding what they're calling specifically an Apple DMA compliance workshop. I'm quoting uh, the announcement here uh, where it's an actual like in person workshop in Brussels where uh, for people actually in person uh, prioritizing seating for, and I'm also quoting here, so you know, like who they're addressing this at, quote, representatives of Apple, business users of Apple's designated core platform services and associations with represent, which represent a large number of stakeholders. So the fact that they have, and this is not like a half hour, like Zoom meeting, like they've actually blocked out an entire day for these sort of things. So the fact that even they're saying, look, we're having a meeting to, to have a discussion about like, what do you think all these rules mean what is going to apply, what is not going to apply means that it's not as though there's going to be like a vendetta of ban hammers and, and, uh, and, uh, and fines. This is going to be trying to figure out, here's the law. Now let's figure out what compliance actually means. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge piece of legislation and it's obviously huge, like groups of technology companies, not just Apple affected by this. And I think it's interesting because we always knew this would be kind of fuzzy. We always knew that I think to a certain degree, when the rubber hit the road, there was going to be questions about where are the loopholes? Where do you draw the lines? What things can you reasonably do? What things you can't do? I mean, you can't just put an entire corpus of law into effect and immediately understand exactly how compliance and, and enforcement is going to work. It's going to take real world examples. So as Alex said, I think it's going to take six months before we sort of see exactly how much the situation stabilizes. And I'm kind of curious in, in terms of where you know, other countries around the world fall into this category. The EU is a great trial balloon. It's a good chance to see how that works out. And a part of me wonders if things like, you know, we've heard rumblings of the DOJ finalizing some antitrust stuff against Apple. And I have to wonder if part of them is like, let's see how this plays out in Europe. And we can figure out exactly what we can get away with here in the US in terms yeah. of what that, like, what can we enforce? What can we demand? Because it's very easy to be like, look at what you've done in Europe and do that over here yeah. but that there needs to be a will for that and that is still sorely lacking yeah the, the, the fact that this is an, this is a, an opportunity for all of these things that doom and gloom have been predicted from apple saying well we can't do this because that will totally violate the entire platform also on the other side uh regulators saying hey look what what if, if people have a choice of app platforms imagine having and that uh, so many new app platforms are going to bloom and proliferate and we're going to have competition now we get to actually see like you say where the rubber meets the road and a lot of this stuff is not just uh stuff that's like eight eight uh, pay levels above us, uh, the, the level of the users. Uh, another thing that came out again on the day that the uh, DMA went into effect, Apple released their report of compliance saying that here is how we're complying now. Here's how we intend to comply in the future. And there's some stuff in there that is just universally really good for users. For instance, that uh, by, I think they said by 2025, they intend to have uh, features and services in place so that if you do want to switch from the iPhone to an Android uh, phone, we are going to have tools in place that make that migration a lot easier. We already have Apple already has that assistant that makes uh, it easier, for, makes it attractive for an Android user to move to iPhone. Google has the same tool in the reverse, but the idea of saying, okay, we are going to officially ensconce this as something that we should and are kind of forced to do will make it easier for those people who are making the switch on both sides to not think that they are trying to change all the furniture in the room without without uh, without uh, changing the floor. So something I, I should close the loop on this. What ended up happening is that um, somebody from the EU whispered in Apple's ear and said, you can't um, you can't ban Epic from the <laughs> App Store for crimes committed that are actually legal in the EU under the DMA and for criticizing you in public, which, you know, it's a sidebar here, but I, I, I said this on uh, the Upgrade podcast yesterday. I'll say it again here. Anybody who's worked with Apple over the course of decades knows that Apple is extremely sensitive to public criticism from those it perceives of as business partners. And I think what happened here is like when Phil Schiller sent the email to Tim Sweeney saying, you know, you're going to tell me, assure me you're going to comply. And he said, yes, we will. I think from Phil Schiller's standpoint, 
compliance includes not <laughs> criticizing Apple's policies, mm -hmm. which I don't think a reasonable person would believe, but I do think that that is Apple's attitude. By the way, speaking of compliance, um, a lot of people are, are using the phrase malicious compliance to talk about what Apple is doing. <laughs> I don't think that's right. I think I would say something more like incremental compliance or limited compliance. I think Apple's goal here is to do what they think is the least they need to do to satisfy the regulators. Knowing, is my theory, knowing that they're going to get bumped in other directions by regulators after the initial rollout. And my evidence is what happened today, which is after a very detailed system that Apple set up for alternative marketplaces, basically exterior app stores, because they were given the option in the DMA to either set up third-party app stores or and or allowed side loading. Today, Apple said, oh, actually, funny thing, later this spring, you can do side loading too. And there are some rules about it, but that was clearly never part of their original plan. And I think that's an example of incremental compliance where they decided to read the DMA as strictly as possible and then uh, see what happened. <laughs> and, and now we're seeing, and it's fascinating, we are seeing Apple make these changes in the EU, like their limitations on external linking. Also today, they announced mm -hmm. that, remember that template you had to use <laughs> mandatorily if you're linking outside consider it, if it was more, more of a, a guide more of a suggestion <laughs> yeah. and so we're seeing oh, that happen we were serious about that oh come on yeah yeah you know, that's you why know, they Jason, call him silly phil over <laughs> cupertino you know that yeah yeah i think yeah, and we'll I, also see you know how users feel about it too <laughs> like, yeah, like, you know indeed. so i think that you know being forced to be like i mean if if i get an external link in in my thing that there's a one star coming really fast you know like like no thank you and i'm going to spike you, <laughs> you know, because because i hate being sent out of out of, the, yeah, out of my we'll environment see. you know like the thing is i'm happy to pay more i don't want to deal with somebody else i don't want to give them my emails i don't want to give them my money directly i don't want to do any of those things and i take it personally right. you know the, like you know and so, the and EU, so the thing is that we'll see the eu is sort of making the assumption here that this is what people want what customers want and they may be yeah, the deeply mistaken in that that it may be what, what developers want, want. I don't, like, but not what customers like, this want is what, this is what I, a bunch of rich companies want to have this is not what users want like yeah, users I, I, do not want to have have to go out to a website and remember their passwords and have yeah. to manage like where their pers pers uh, subscriptions are and everything else that is not user friendly yeah. Yeah. you know like and, and that's going to be and people are going to start to talk about it and they're going to start to get frustrated you know about it too well yeah and th i don't i don't think the eu is in their documentation has been talking about how well this we're we're doing we're putting these regulations in place in response to uh user demand or user desire it's more like they they believe in principle that that uh, there is a there is a whole category of things that are just you're abusing your power certainly saying that oh by the way you're not allowed to link to your own website so that you're even even your own users can can be facilitated to get more information about like this product you're not allowed to cultivate a relationship directly with the user you the user has a relationship with us and we're not going to let you let you in on that um but yeah i mean jason's absolutely right there's uh, just in the past couple of weeks we've seen first to uh, first it seemed as though apple was going to kill web apps uh and not because and not out of spite but because they didn't know if the fact that uh, a web app would have to run using uh, apple's browser technology is that would that be now a violation of the uh, of the DMA. Then they backed off of that because they seem to have gotten reactions. Says, okay, it looks like we can get away with that. There is uh, in the alternative app store rules. One of the early rules was, oh, and by the way, you're going to have to put up a million dollars, one million dollars, if you want to start an app store. Uh, and that was going to be a barrier to so many small like startups, even if they tried to get a bond instead of uh, trying to get the actual amount. Then they backed off on that as well. So I, I, I like what I'm seeing. I don't. I, I'm not disappointed at all by Apple looking at the laws and saying what is the least hassle the least dangerous way of, of complying with this while still complying with that because that's just that's just that's what law is about it's like well, that, and exactly. you have these guardrails in place because you want to know i don't I, I don't want to be a foul of the law but give me a guardrail so that i know when i'm about to cross it this is this is one of the reasons why uh all every single tech company keeps saying that hey every time there's a new statewide law banning this or controlling that one of the biggest 
responses from Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, everything. It's like, we want a national law. We don't want to have to deal with 50 different states' attorneys generals with different political agendas that we have to lobby <laughs> with, with infinite amounts of money. Give us a national law that we can start, we can create our policy against, and then we will start to make things better. Yeah. Anybody who thinks that, that it's malicious or, or anything else should also remember, like, do you ever go to H and R block or yeah, do you ever well, go right. to, like, <laughs> right. you know, like, do you, you try know, to like pay the least amount in your to... own taxes? Exactly. Right. Right. That's, and, and exactly. that's why I say malicious isn't the right word for it. I do think it's incremental that the idea is Apple, yeah. look, Apple's not going to say, you know what you asked for, you asked for the moon, but we're going to give you the whole solar system. That's not how it works. They're like, we're going to read this the yeah. strictest as possible. But what's fascinating. And Dan, um, you and I were talking about this earlier today is that we are now seeing Apple is you know apple says well we got feedback from developers and other stakeholders it's like who are the other stakeholders i wonder uh and 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 so <laughs> so dan you know we were we were seeing this that the, the, this is now phase two which is oh that wasn't good enough for you okay here's some more how about now yeah right and and, and apple's clearly gamed out whatever scenario they felt like would be the worst case scenario right they have sat in the room and thought about okay if this really doesn't go our way what are the steps? How do we actually do these things? And I think they then have a lot of those things kind of in their back pocket to think, okay, if we need to deploy this, this is what we're going to do. And I think this web distribution angle thing that they've rolled out today is a clear example of that. There's a reason it's coming later this spring. It's because they were not ready to do it now. <laughs> but they knew that the possibility would exist, that they would not meet the criteria of what the DMA set out. And so they had to have something ready to go where it's like, all right, we if we need to be able to, to uh, you know, have side loading in addition to third party at, at marketplaces, this is how we're going to do it and how we're going to do it in such a way that we can still ensure some degree of safety and security. And I think there there is a good point to what both Alex and Andy were talking about in terms of how do the users fall into this? Because I think that there is both a positive and a negative to it, right? I'm sure users who would prefer, for example, hey, it'd be great if I could buy Kindle books in my Kindle app on my iPhone, right? Like, <laughs> I don't want to go to an external site necessarily, but also Apple is also not letting, you know, Amazon do that without jumping through a bunch of hoops that Amazon is literally never going to jump through. So how do you find that middle ground of like, hey, I want to have all my stuff and be able to access it from my device without having to go through a lot of trouble, without having to do a lot of extra steps. But how do I do that in a way, like, you know, way that Apple's actually going to let people do that because they want to keep everybody in their own ecosystem. Yeah, and there's the there's also something that keeps coming up that I think is relevant, which is the chilling effect. Which is the fact is, in a uh, in a closed app store system where Apple has to approve everything, and this has been the case, um, app developers have to wonder, they have to ch consult their inner Apple, right, and say, <laughs> will this get approved? And Apple doesn't pre-approve concepts. So if you're on the edge of something that Apple might not approve, I'll tell you, it's already happened, probably numerous times over the last decade, you just don't do it because there's nowhere else you can take that app. It's an iOS app. And in at least certain circumstances, somebody could do this and offer it on their, um, on their website. And uh, it may be, maybe even just as a fallback, if it doesn't get approved for the app store, at least there would be some revenue there. I do suspect, Dan, that uh, this seems a lot like the way you would get a marketplace on your device, right? Like they're using existing tech. First off, they they repurposed um, the, the notarization stuff that they rolled out on the Mac. And now in this case, the way you get an app, you will be able to get an app via somebody's website is awfully mm -hmm. similar to the way that you would install that app if it was an, a previously announced app marketplace where you go to a URL and and that one's been approved, that website's been approved and you download it. So they're, you know, repurposing things they've already built in order to make this to happen. Sure. But it is yeah. fascinating that this was like, they had a very careful, uh, carefully described and detailed description of how this was all going to work. And then the DMA goes into effect. And one week later, they're like, oh, also the spring downloads. And like, you can see it. This is, it's going to be <laughs> like this for a while, I think, where little itty bitty things are going to get pushed forward. Although I did get, uh, somebody told me today that um, one way to look at this is that this is all to serve uh, bigger developers. And I think that there's some truth to that, that the, the, the EC is listening to the large developers because a good thing that I would think that they would, that the European commission would look at is Apple is using a very interesting proxy for what, what they consider a reliable developer. And that is that they have uh, a million app downloads in the EU in the previous year and have been a developer in good standing for two years. And that will 
cl- that'll cover major developers and even kind of mid-range indie developers. But smaller developers won't qualify and therefore won't be allowed to do this, even if they've been a developer in good standing for a long time, if they don't have enough of a user base. And I, part of me thinks that'll be something that the EC may yeah. not like, I, uh, but I, but I not if they're coming it, in an or yeah. like situation where it's like, or you're, you've been in, you know, you've had good tenure for these years, or you've passed a certain number of downloads because I agree with you. There's a lot of people who kind of get left out in the cold by that, who are never going to have a million downloads exactly. for anything because mm-hmm. it's just not the way it is. And like, do those people not deserve to be able to distribute their apps on the web? That's a real question. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I think the other thing though is, is as a, I mean, and again, this will be up to the users to decide, but as a user, I would very rarely, like the one secure thing I have on my, is my phone, you know, and the thing, the chances of me going outside of the app store to, to do that are pretty low. But the other thing to realize is how few people are actually taking advantage of this. If you look at this, this, this graph here, 86% of realtors never take a commission for it, never get a, you know, never pay a commission to Apple for what they're doing. Um, you know, 12% are in this world of they're paying 15%. And there's only 2% of the developers that are paying 30%. So really the argument is all happening about that area. I mean, this really is a, uh, it's really, I mean, well, yes and no, right? Because aristocratic conversation here of of, of those rich company. And you know, the bottom line is, is that none of the companies that are being regulated against are European. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and so, so of course it's easy for the EU to do this because they, they want, they don't want their, you know, their companies, you know, you know, they're, they're protecting their own companies, their own aristocratic companies from our aristocratic companies. But that's, this is really a battle of the aristocracy. I mean, Not, yes, and, and, yes. And we're going to get trampled yeah, like as users, yes, we will be trampled. Yes, no, there, there, I mean, keep in mind, of course, any of these companies that are European also at this point, we're talking about all the tech companies, as you said, aristocratic are so big that they have worldwide reach. They may be headquartered in the European Union, but it doesn't mean that they don't have arms everywhere else. I mean, Spotify, <laughs> yes, is a European company at whole, but they do a ton of business this, in the I, US. I don't believe if Spotify was in the United States that this law would exist. Period. But that's because Spotify would have had to complain to the United States government, which would be bound by it. And the United <laughs> States government's definitely not going to do anything about that. <laughs> but well, I mean, I think the, the part of the challenge is also like a lot, huge percentage of those apps that are not paying any sort of commission to Apple are based on, you know, models of monetization that don't go through the app store, right? Things like ads, right? A lot of apps that are services. making money. And I mean, yeah, or just services, of right? Just, that, uh, all the apps that I built up to, up to, to date, all the ones that I've worked on the development of, have n- none of them have... I've charged anything for. They're they're for companies who put something out that helps them promote what they're doing and helps them do those things. You know, put those things out. There's been one that's been sold, but outside of that, it is um, they've they've all been you know uh, apps that are free. You know, so there's not any commission. And we do have to go. Oh, you sent you sent something to Apple, and Apple sends it back. You know, like we I we give about a three to four week turn from the time we do, from the time we submit to Apple, we expect it within three to four weeks to be in the App Store, and so we submit it. They come back and say, no, you can't do this. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then you move and you submit it two or three times and then you're, you're in, you know, and, you know, we tend to call that adulting, you know, about how to get in. So mm-hmm. it's, it, but it rarely is, rarely do we get something back that, that we go, oh, I just didn't think of that. Like, I didn't think that that, that that would be a problem. I mean, rarely do we get something. And again, there are so many things to build apps around that the fact that you're building ones that Apple doesn't think are, that Apple isn't going to let through um, you're really dancing along a very, very small edge between, you know, there's this, there's the, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a bunch of stuff Apple's not going to let you do. And then there's a, there's this stuff and the people who are confused are in here or they're over here and they want to, you know, sell porn. So, um, you know, so that, you know, so that, I think that's like, the only thing they want to do, but <laughs> yes. <That's>, uh, mostly. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the, uh, um, and so the, uh, so I think that, you know, it's, it's rarely unclear and again, there's just so many opportunities that don't require you to get anywhere near that edge. Like, that's the thing that I'm always amazed by is that they're like, I can't build my app. Well, what are you doing with your app? You're, you're, you're trying to, you know, find some loophole that Apple doesn't, that usually says somewhere in the policy you can't do. Um, and if you don't try to get creative and you just produce a great, right. Don't, don't, app, don't try to get creative app developers. Yeah. Um, unless you're <laughs> in, unless you're in Europe, I guess. Look, I'm, 
I'm I'm a kid. Alex, we've had, I'm a we've kid. had decades of stories of developers try, getting rejections for things that are not them trying to pull one over on, on Apple, yeah. but that Apple has just decided they don't want that app in the store. I mean, it, it has happened. And is it, is it a huge number? No, but it's been happening. It's a steady drumbeat over a decade. I'd say it's lessened in the last few years because people have learned not to try because Apple will mm -hmm. just say no, and then they'll have nowhere else to take their 100%. software. I'm not sure that this will solve any of that in the EU. I think it's unlikely because you're going to, now you're like, great, we can sell our app in one region. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> it, it is a chilling effect it is real. And I know developers who have said, well, I'm never going to develop this good idea because I don't know if Apple would accept it. Yeah. Oh, and also I, 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 by, by Paul, by as a matter of policy, but also I think there's evidence that this actually works out in Apple's history. Apple doesn't do anything that they aren't excited about doing. They don't want to do unless there is pressure from somewhere. Every positive change that's happened in the App Store for the past five years has happened only because people are starting to hold their feet to the fire and Apple's starting to negotiate and send the, the, the people who have inside of Apple who have always been arguing that, look, it is kind of silly that we can't that or maybe this made sense when we opened the App Store in, in 2007, 2008, but no longer makes any sense that we can't allow uh, developers to have a relationship with the users that the user might actually want. Can't we can't we re reduce this a little bit? It's it's kind of silly that people who are only who are only making uh, who only stand to make about two or three thousand dollars a year off of their app. Why are we trying to get 30 percent off of them? Can't we just let them have like five thousand dollars instead of three thousand dollars? Because that'll make a big, big difference. It'll encourage them to make great apps. And also it's the weirdos that make like the real on the edge breaking new grand uh, testing, making apps that we, that we can't make for, make for ourselves. So I, the, on all the dimensions of these discussions about uh, pressures from regulation, I just think that if makes, if it makes Apple listen more closely to arguments internally that say that, look, why are we being so tight about this? Why can't we loosen this up? Why can't we give more opportunities? If this change would only improve the lives of 5% of our users, those 5% are going to really appreciate that our platform is easier to use and seems less draconian and unfair. So why don't we I do would, it? And I would argue that's easier to use for the developers because it is not going to be easier to use for the users, you know, and the users, uh, and this is going to leave the, the problem that smaller developers are going to have is a loss of trust. You know, I looked at how many, how many, uh, cause there's so much you depend on the app store. Part of what the app store does, it goes, well, Apple's looked at all these things. And while that some things get through, not very many, you know, in a percentage perspective. perspective. Um, but what I have looked at is how few apps I download now. And I realize now this isn't part of the EU, but I download uh, probably one tenth the number of apps that I used to. And I realized with subscriptions, <laughs> like, you know, like subscriptions have me like, oh, you know, and there is zero chance that I'm going to get something on the outside. But I do think that what's going to happen if they're not careful is that the users will get upset and the users will become more assertive. And it's a lot harder to control a bunch of angry users than it is to control a big company. Well, you know, and if people I'd start getting assertive about how to how to prove how to nail this to nail this to the ground, if users decide to do something about it, for instance, running around with one star. I um, hate they I, can, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm but tell I you. absolutely hate that attitude. You, yeah, uh, well. it, it's, 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 it's a real dirtbag response to saying, oh, so if I gave you $10 for this app and the, I go open the app and I said, hi, Alex, you're an idiot. I hate you. And here's a, here's a, here's a fake photo of you kissing a duck. It would still get a one star app. That's totally disrespectful of the work wow. that goes into it. I don't like you're, you're free to, you're free to make that, to make that free statement, but <laughs> I do the, think that's dirtbag behavior. That's no, awesome. You're I, not a dirtbag. Right, neutral corners, neutral corners. I think, neutral corners, to, I think what we're going to end up finding, I think, well, I think, I think what we're going to end up we're, finding a user has the right to assert themselves. Is that, is that <laughs> we will find out a couple of things going forward. Cause obviously we're going to be talking about this forever. Um, one is <laughs> how do the users respond? Because I do think that that's part of this is there's assumptions being made about, Oh, this is going to be great. And people are going to use it and they're going to find just the sound of crickets. And that's going to be instructive in some ways. And then we're also going to find the places where Apple has to shift. It's very carefully constructed strategy. But again, I, I, I really believe that part of the strategy is the shifting part and where they're pushed into changing their behavior and what the ramifications of that behavior change is. Yeah. But in, in the end, you can change all the rules and uh, you want, but the users, if the users aren't interested or don't follow you, if the experience is bad, I will point out that the apps are scanned by Apple for all sorts of things, even if they're outside the store. But um, 
um, just like they are on the Mac, except more so. Um, we'll watch yeah. it and we'll see what happens. It's a very dynamic story. Fascinating to see change happening in Apple's App Store policies in many ways for the first time ever in some areas. So we will be back <laughs> to talk about things that are probably not European based. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> the future is a mystery. But right now I want to throw it to uh, Leo, who earlier was sitting in the chair I'm sitting in now to tell you about our first sponsor, Leo. Thanks, Jason. Just popped in to say hello and tell you about our sponsor for this hour, Melissa, the data quality experts since 1985. Melissa offers free trials, sample codes, flexible pricing, and an ROI guarantee because they know money's tight, but you're going to get what you pay for with Melissa. Not only that, unlimited technical support to customers all around the world. Melissa's international address validation cleans and corrects street addresses worldwide. Of course, U.S. and Canada, too. Addresses, so many features. You can look up longitude and latitude. You can automatically transliterate from one language to another, like Chinese to Cyrillic. If you want to give it a try, there are free Melissa Lookup apps, free on Google Play or the App Store. Search for Melissa Lookups. No sign-up is required. You can use them to validate an address or personal identity in the U.S. and Canada. You can check global phone numbers to find caller, carrier, geographic information. You can check global IP address information and more. Melissa has achieved the highest level of security status available by gaining FedRAMP authorization. Now, that probably doesn't mean a lot to non-federal employees, but it sure helps in terms of security. We all benefit. All Melissa users automatically gain that superior level of security with FedRAMP. Melissa's solutions and services are also GDPR compliant, CCPA compliant. They meet SOC 2 and HIPAA high trust standards for information security management. They consider your data pretty darn precious and they protect it just like their own. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free. Try the API at Melissa. Dot com slash twit. They have it on prem. They have SAS. They have FTP servers. Any way you want it. Melissa.com slash twit. Now back to Jason. Thank you, Leo. Uh from your chair. He he said it was okay, everybody. Don't get mad. I can I can be here in this chair. It's okay. <laughs> um now don't nobody tell Leo. Let's talk about the Vision Pro. Um <laughs> <laughs> Vision OS 1.1 1 .1, uh, was released last week. It improves personas. I can personally attest to the fact that they are uh, they're better. Uh, I, I would even say less creepy. I'd say more accurate. Uh, my favorite thing about the new persona capture is that there's an accessibility mode. You can actually uh, take a capture or a persona while you're not putting your arms out like Frankenstein holding the Vision Pro. You can be a little <laughs> more relaxed and set it on a sort of an eye level instead it's very nice um and it does look better and there are a bunch of other features as well uh mobile device management if you're in an organization that's rolling out vision pro to staff you can actually manage those <laughs> devices now i message contact key verification uh they finally synced that up so you can actually use it and there's a, a grab bag of other things including improvements to the virtual display support for captive wi-fi networks uh you know some little things that are nicer yeah so if you're logging in in a hotel or an organization where you have to log into wi-fi you can do that. Um, and uh, there's a, even shortcuts improvements in there too. So uh, not presumably there'll be a Vision OS 2.0 at WWDC in June. But in the meantime, I like that Apple is continuing to update Vision OS because lest we forget, if you don't want to take your life into your own hands and install beta software, uh, Vision OS is not going to get a 2.0 improvement until September. And it feels like the OS probably should get some more incremental improvements between now and then. So this is, I would say a good sign i don't know i i, I think if alex you you have a vision pro uh have you tried this update you know i haven't tried i haven't done a um, i haven't seen the persona since it got updated i just i i do use it um but i haven't used it i just haven't used it since the last update all right um there was nothing else that i really noticed that was dramatically different although i, I after the update there were a couple apps that actually got broke a little bit so i think that they're <laughs> still working on some of the you yeah. know so um, I got into a situation like on the Red Bull app and a couple other apps where you get you get between the interface and the selector. So you can get in the situation and the Red Bull app for some reason does it more often than not, uh, for me anyway, where you get the video in front of you and the controller is behind you. And the only way to get out of that is to 
kill the app. You know, like there's not any like, and, and so you still feel like you're a little bit in the in the very beginning of it. I will say that again, we've talked about this over and over again. I, I'm always surprised at how long I spend time in it. I just, you know, I, I was talking, we were talking about this morning in office hours and I, and one of the things I noticed is I said, when I go into the quest, which I do fairly often as well, um, it's, you know, I'm going in to do something and then I leave. When I go into the headset, I usually don't have a plan. I just put it on and start hanging out. Like I'm, I'm going to watch some movies. I'm going to go check this out. I'm going to see if there's any new apps. There's going to be, you know, and it's just a very different experience from a usability perspective. And then I suddenly realize I've lost two hours or three hours. And, and that's the, that's the thing that I think is very distinct from it. And someone was asking about, is it the same as watching an 85 inch TV? Um, and I really have looked at it and it really is sharper than my 80, than mm. 75, 75. 75 inch TV, I can't d diagnose the grain on my TV the way I diagnose it on the Vision Pro. And so I, you know, it's a really fascinating, um, you know, a lot of us are talking about theatrical releases and so on and so forth. And, and uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how this affects that over time. Yeah, it's, it's a great um, movie watching platform. I do think it's incredible. I, I would like uh, one thing that, that we should note is that it's been a few weeks now and there's no new immersive content on the TV app, which I think is interesting. Like, um, remember they, they didn't ship yeah. that, uh, MLS, uh, the highlights of the MLS playoffs last season are still not out. And they, uh, that new season has started. And I think that that's an example yeah. where post-production on this is probably real hard. Um, well, but I would like to see more content. Can be, you know, a lot of people right now are working. The big thing that everyone's working on in my world is how do we get to MVHEBC? So, so that's not a, there's no great platform for that right now. Um, there are some HLS tools that are out there. There's a couple of companies that are building those. Atem, which is out of France, is building a live encoder that will do some of those things. So how do we take a side-by-side a -side and convert it to the format that it needs for the, for the Vision Pro, and um, which is the MVHEBC? And so they've come out with this product, or they've come out with this support, but app, even Apple isn't like, I keep on saying, hey, we'd like to have some more information. All we hear is, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like they're not, they're no, they're just, just like, oh, they got to build know, their own so tools true. first before they can tell other people because well, they're still figuring it out. The, the MVHEBC is a known thing. It's Standard. just that Apple hasn't been, you know, like, and, and we can deliver to it as a, you know, as a regular HLS. It's the streaming part that has been a little bit, you know, everyone's, and again, a TEM is probably the furthest along as far as a hardware appliance. Um, and so there, but those are the things that I think a lot of us are excited about is how do we start delivering concerts and other things directly to the headset? And I think that that's going to be, and then, you know, um, you know, cause we've learned a lot working, we've worked, we've learned a lot shooting for meta, uh, or, or for the meta platform. And so we all have things we want to do in the, in the vision pro. And so I think that it's going to be, um, it's going to be really interesting as we get closer and closer because NAB is coming up between now and WWDC. NAB is the National Association of Broadcasters Convention that'll happen um, the middle of April. And we, uh, there are rumors that we'll see more cameras, you know, that are more leaning towards, you know, like the new, the next stereo video is, revolution is about to come up. We don't know if it'll last more than two or three years like every other one has, but it, it's about to turn back on again. <laughs> you know, so suddenly, you know, there's the lens, the dual lenses and the, and the dual cameras and all those things are starting to happen again um, as we, as we get a little closer to NAB. And so we'll see, we'll see what happens there. And then as that rolls into WWDC. Yeah. I hope there's more content soon. I'm looking forward to it because that is one of the great things about yeah. You saw the dinosaur one, right? I think that was the last one I've seen that the one where you're on the beach with the yeah. dinosaurs running yeah. around. Oh, yeah. well, I've yeah. seen them all I now. The I, I've run out of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I want yeah. more. I want that, uh, I want that MLS, uh, but I'll take anything. Like I, I just want more immersive video because it is such a great experience and it's so fun. I mean, I watched, I watched Dune in 3D, right? Like I, I, 3D movies are great, yeah. but like the immersive stuff is is amazing. And actually, 2D, what? I think is really nice. Like like you said, Alex, the the picture can feel um, huge and immaculate in a way that is yeah. remarkable. But uh, your 3D brain flips in and like it's it's you're processing that image differently. But watching a 2D piece of entertainment that's at high quality in that space. It looks so good. It really does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, a friend of the show, um, <laughs> uh, has more, th more to say about the vision pro unsurprisingly. Now I, 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 I hesitate to break this up. It's in our show doc. I'll mention it. It is a little bit like do a dog bites man kind of story. Cause it's a person with product that he's selling. Keep insists that his product is good. Um, of course he does. 
Of course he does. So he he is obviously sensitive about comparisons to the Vision Pro. What's interesting is uh, he responded to a thread from uh, venture capitalist Benedict Evans, who said Vision Pro is the device Meta wants to reach in three to five years, and the Quest is selling at the price Apple wants to reach in three to five years. I think this is a pretty decent take. And Mark Zuckerberg did not. He's like, no, 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 uh, we're better. We are better. We're going to double down on the fact that we're better. And Apple, did you know that Apple has motion blur? Um, and yeah, their resolution is higher, but they've made other trade-offs. That's not what we aspire to. And we're not just for games. We have social apps. And I honestly think this is one of his strongest arguments is that Apple is a little behind in the collaborative workspace area where you can actually have like a little avatar and be in a virtual room with people and have uh, have some virtual objects in common. And that's something that Apple is a little bit further back on, although I think they they will probably prioritize that and catch up. I don't blame Mark Zuckerberg for for saying this. I just think it's a it's interesting that he feels like he really needs to extol the virtues of his product. I'm on the record as saying, I think one of the greatest things to ever happen to the Quest is the Vision Pro, because not only is the Quest way cheaper than the Vision Pro, but it means we're all talking about VR headsets. We're all talking about comparing the Vision Pro to the Quest. And I think that's good for the Quest, because I think the Quest problem was that nobody knew it was a category or a product or was talking about it. And I say that as somebody who owns a Quest, three and a quest two so i think it's good for mark but i also totally get that he's defending his product um that that said uh motion blur and this is actually related to another story Mo the motion blur is not in the it's not a reflection on the quality of the screen right it's a re reflection on the quality of the cameras in the vision pro and canon in another story that uh that was at petapixel uh, uh executives from canon pointed out that perhaps uh, even Canon does not make a camera good enough to match the screen of the Vision Pro, the display of the Vision Pro inside. And that's clearly, as a 1.0 product, the the place that I'm fascinated where one tech is ahead of the other here is that the displays are better than the cameras. So um, virtual stuff, fake stuff in the Vision Pro looks way better than reality because the reality has to come through a camera and the camera struggles to, to match reality uh, because it can't capture it as well, which I, I just think that's fascinating. And I think it's true because when I go into a virtual environment, it looks way better and there's no motion blur. And there is in reality. That's just, it's clear, right? It because, you know, as we've all discussed for years and years leading up to this, what Apple probably wants to do eventually is build some form of smart glasses. And the virtue of smart glasses is you don't have to recreate what the human eye is doing because the human eye is already doing it. So you don't have to worry about reproducing things, you know, with absolute fidelity, because if you can essentially pass through people's actual vision, not using a camera and screens to replace that, then those problems kind of solve themselves. But that technology is so far away that we really have no insight to it whatsoever so for the moment we have to deal with sort of what is the state of the art in terms of how good can we replicate this faction facet of biology that obviously has been designed and honed over millions of years and that's a big challenge for a lot of this tech and i think it is you know it's a great point that like there is an imbalance in terms of we've gotten really great at screens right because we've been building these screens better and smaller and faster and higher quality and higher resolution for a decade now, plus driven by all these revolutions in technology. And not to say cameras have not improved as well. Obviously, they have. You take your iPhone 15 Pro camera and stack it up against your original iPhone camera, and it's night and day. But the, the curve on those has clearly not improved, in part, I think, because they've had to deal a lot more there with issues of size and, and like, image quality and things like that that are probably just harder problems overall. So uh, all that stuff will continue to improve, but it's going to take a lot of time. And part of me does wonder at what point do you hit on that curve? Do you hit the, you know, the other technologies coming in that might make that technology not as useful to you in terms of where you're intending to take that product in the long run? Yeah, and, and I don't think we're that far away from that lim the limit of what the, what the product needs to do either. So I think that, you know, the Vision Pro, the next pro version of the vision most likely a couple of years away most of us are guessing we're going to see 8k per eye or higher plus 120 frames a second the, the 90 frames a second is kind of a little bit of a uh that was a compromise <laughs> like, you know, so 90 frames a second is like that's an mvp for a headset um and so so i think that that is um uh or a minimum viable product for a headset the uh but the 120 frames a second was probably very very hard to do and it's very very hard to do get to 8k per eye but we can probably assume that. I don't think it's going to go much more than that. So the, the, the good news is, is that we're getting to the top of where the headset wants to go. And then after that, 
it's going to be a lot of other creature comforts and you know that are there but we know that there are cameras out there that can do that right now um you know and so those are all um uh you know those are i think that's a little bit of there are definitely cameras that are able to shoot a still i mean a, a video image that can be displayed at the highest resolution on the on on it it's just that they, they're not in they're not practical for production yet so that's the that's the issue um and so like you know if you get a, you know the sphere camera for instance is an 8k 18k camera um and you know that that kind of resolution is probably something that's probably not far away from other cameras as the as the pressure starts to build to to, to reach these right the challenge the challenge is going to get to get the cameras good enough for them to sit <laughs> on the device to capture reality <laughs> versus the professional level stuff. And that's just, I mean, it's just going to be yeah. a challenge. We've got, like Dan said, we've gotten really, really good at screens and not, qu- and we've gotten really good at cameras, but not quite as good as that we've got at screens. That's just where we are right now. Yeah. I, I, I will be the- interested to see if we see 4k in the um, 16, the iPhone 16. So we saw 1080p, which does feel pretty soft. Um, I'd be really interested to see if they, they go ahead in the 16. That's a big bump for a stereo a capture. 4K 60. 4K 60 stereo capture yeah. will look dramatically different in the headset. Like it is not, it won't, it's like night and day compared to what we're getting right now with the 1080. Yeah. And this was a good piece by Petapixel because oftentimes when you hear like, uh, when you see a headline like, oh, Canon executive says, blah, blah, blah. You wonder if this is okay. Well, Canon wanted to make sure that they are part of this news cycle that uh, they can get they get some attention for their executives with their technologies because a lot of people are writing about Vision Pro. No, this was someone from Peter Pixel was just happened to be talking to executives at an event, and they were ta- and they were talking about this. Uh, the, the exact was talking about the exact problems here, uh, and yeah, uh, 18, that eighteen K camera that they, in the in the article they do mention that yeah this is a it requires like 18 people to even operate uh the executive was saying that they're looking for 100 megapixels or like a 14k uh video capture which is in no way practical 60 frames per second <laughs> is doubly not practical uh but yeah that's this is things are going to take a while to sync up um i did want to say, I'm, I'm sorry but i i have i muted myself because i was like loading something on something that cost uh, <laughs> that was going to cause some uh, cause some noise um just quickly to button what we're talking about about on uh, on uh, on the MetaQuest, that yeah, that the, I do understand why he was talking about stuff like that because one of the most brilliant things it turns out I think that Apple did was to reframe augmented reality, virtual reality in terms of spatial computing. Exactly. It's not a term that they invented, but it does help them to frame it as no, no, no this is a platform for for running apps, and yes, virtual reality and games are going to be some of the apps on that platform. Whereas MetaQuest is most obviously most uh, closely tied to entertainment experience and game experiences because they have so such such a rich library that way. Uh, There was a a bunch of news, I think, a few weeks ago. I think the information had some uh, had talked to somebody who was who was privy to conversations that uh, Meta was having with Google about bringing Android XR and the Google Play Store for uh, virtual reality apps to the to the MetaQuest. And it fell apart largely because like uh, the meta runs on open source Android. And I think they'd much rather build their own app store and not be required, not rely on, uh, on, and uh, on Google's faith and vision plan for virtual reality for bringing their own platform forward. But it was important for, for uh, Zuckerberg to make the point that no, this is not just a, this is not a Nintendo. This is not a limited games platform. This is a full computing device that, for now, the best thing it does is run games, but there is no stop. There's nothing stopping it necessarily from running the same kind of iPad apps that the uh, uh, that the Vision Pro runs. Well, what, what, what we're lacking is a is a developer community that's been developing apps like that for like ten years. And and that's exactly what I was going to say. The, it's the the ecosystem that Apple sits inside of is its real advantage in the sense that you have a lot of developers that have to do very little to start developing for this platform. In fact, they can just let their iPad apps be yeah. openable you know, in that area. And so, so that is, that makes it a lot, a lot easier. And, and you have this huge ecosystem. I, I know that a big chunk of why I spend so much time in the, in the vision pro much more than the meta uh, than, than the quest is because uh, I have so many things already there. My notes and my, my FaceTime and my movies. And, you know, since I buy all my movies in Apple TV, that all paid off. You know, and so <laughs> photos and all these other things. So I, all that stuff's already built in when I got there. And for developers, all of that's kind of built in uh, as you, as you get there. And so there's a lot of it that's a lot easier to step over. Um, I think that the reason it's very, it's, it's much harder to build those apps from, for the, for the quest, because it's, you're kind of starting from scratch. Right. And I yeah, think that that's real, a, 
Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah, me too. I was going to say there's a real inversion here too in terms of, you know, meta focusing on things like games and like some sort of social collaboration, which seem to be areas that Apple is definitely lacking on right now. There, the gaming story on Vision Pro is still very meager. The social mm-hmm. collaboration stuff, as Jason pointed out, is also very thin on the ground. Those are areas that Meta spent a lot of time and energy building up its catalog. There are also areas that Apple has questionable interest in. I'm sure Apple <laughs> would love, in some ways, if a lot of more games were brought to the Vision Pro, but they have done very little to support that. They have very, done very little to encourage that. Uh, similarly, collaboration is something that they have tried to nail even on their existing platforms a whole bunch and have not done a great job on. But they do have, as as Alex said, a huge ecosystem of all these apps. And the fact that all those computing technologies are available to people starting on the Vision Pro is enormous because it does automatically start them at a level where we have all these different types of things you can do. And yes, maybe our game story is not as robust as we would like it to be. That's not saying it couldn't develop in that way or they couldn't get better at that. It's just one facet that's missing. And I think they probably have a stronger catalog in that way than Meta does because Meta is sort of starting out pitch and hold. And you can see from these Zuckerberg comments, he wants to make the point that it's larger and it's bigger and it can do more than that. And that is, you know, as you said, like, uh, Jason, a good thing for Meta is the Vision Pro. And I think <laughs> vice versa, too. Like, these are... Uh, these products are very different in some ways, right? Their price tags are very different. Their capabilities out of the box are very different, but they are the closest competitors that exist in this market. And as such, they are going to get lumped together. And I think that's probably good for both of them in terms of having a competitor. You don't want any of these yeah. products to exist in a vacuum. Otherwise, they have no impetus for improving them. Yeah, and I think that the the, the challenge, again, for Meta is like... It's easy for game developers to develop for a headset because you do you build it all in Unreal and then you publish it. You know, it's much different than, you know, you have your, your basic interfaces for how the game's going to work and then you're going to publish that out. It's much more complicated to take that Unreal Engine or Unity or whatever else you want and develop a business app <laughs> with it. And I think that that is still the, the big limitation that you're going to you're going to continue to have that it's going to still going to be hard for Meta to break out of where they're at is because the, the ecosystem, all the APIs, all the controls, all the interfaces, all the other things. Uh, again, I've built apps for Meta as well. And, you know, it's been challenging. Yeah. It's, yeah, it might, <laughs> so. You know what? It's It remains to be seen because um, the thing is, the when people talk about doing using the Vision Pro for things that are not like games or immersive reality experience, we are still talking about, hey, I have a fake screen. I have a rectangle into which yep. I, that will accept mouse clip, mouse clicks and, and keystrokes. That ain't that hard. Uh, given that so many apps, uh, even for, for desktops, are built on a framework that make that uh, are intended to make it portable, if they are able to get those frameworks on Meta and create something that is a more create uh, create policies that make it attractive for developers to deploy uh, on uh, on this platform at scale, I think they'd catch up really quickly. Like we, again, it's still very very early days. I, I think that we can't even talk about the app market for uh, Vision Pro yet not just because it's such a new product but because developers only got their hands on hardware 24 7 a month ago i'm sure that they're not going to start to uh, commit resources for a very very small market based only on an emulator and maybe a couple of days experience at a developer camp so we're i don't think that's actually started but the thing is we're still looking at things on the meta quest like hey isn't it great to have a window to, to basically mirror my screen on my windows machine and i can work very comfortably with this alongside vr apps that's very very attainable so that's why we're gonna it's, it's gonna be really great to see that conflict between how how under spec is the meta quest in terms of frame rate lag resolution accuracy versus how over spec is the uh, vision pro like what how good how much better could the vision pro be if it were a thousand dollars less how much better could the, the meta quest be if it were five hundred dollars more and the difference between again this competition is wonderful for everybody because it's going to help both companies realize that okay maybe we did go a little bit overboard making the absolute best hardware and now meta saying gee if we really do want to pursue this with the with the same intensity that we've been saying we've been improving this we want to we need to address people who want to do this for more than just you know chasing uh, invisible elves across my desktop yeah it's gonna be fascinating to watch um and uh leo uh skipped this part uh that's fine 
It's fine. We're we're he. I, I enjoy giving uh, a little stick to Leo about this, and I I, th- I hope he enjoys taking it. Um, I mean, he's sort of it's friendly he's, ribbing. He it's, started it's it. The lull. He it's started of the lull. it. Like, Come on, it comes out of here. This is where it's coming. It's up coming from, from a place. From that big it's, love. it's a place of love. Um, we're gonna be back with more, including you know, new Apple hardware that we haven't talked about that shipped last week and, uh, and some ads, not, not the ad you're about to see, but (laughs) Apple ads that are kind of, it's an interesting strategy for them. But first I'm going to take you back in time and a message from Leo. Hey Jason, we'll be right back. But first a word from our sponsor, Robin hood. This episode brought to you by Robin hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA. Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. Now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Now back to Jason Snell and Mac Break Weekly. Thank you, Leo, for the legal disclaimers. I love them. I love them. May cause... Better than the illegal disclaimers. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. I was going to... Uh, do not taunt. It's a different story. <laughs> Happy fun ball. Um, you can taunt it in the, the EU. It's okay. We'll see what happens to you, but you can taunt it in the EU. Um, MacBook Air came out last week. I thought we should talk about it. We're, we're deep in the show now, and we haven't even mentioned it. We mentioned that it got announced. I have them here on the desk, if we can show. Oh, look, it's midnight, and it's good for in starlight. This is the 13 and 15-inch MacBook Airs. They're here. They're the M3 models. They look exactly like the M2 models. I, these could be M2 models in front of me, and you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know, but I, I assure you they are the M3. I am not lying when I say this. Um, I wrote a review of this on Six Colors uh, because I got these models last week from Apple, which was very nice of them to send review units. They are uh, what you'd expect. They're as fast as the M3 iMac because it's the same chip, uh, and they have this really nice design. The M2 model is now cheaper, which is really great. We mentioned that last week. Um, I put them on my desk with two displays and a lid-closed uh, MacBook Air, and guess what? It drove two studio displays, which is not a thing that it could do before. And all, I don't know what else to say about them. They're not that different. They really are largely identical. There are a few little things here and there. The ray tracing support, if you want to trace some rays on your game on the M3, it's better. Um, but the Love big trace and rays. It, there's nothing better than trace and catch and rays. <laughs> And trace and raise. Trace them. Um, and yeah. so, uh, but you know, I love the MacBook Air. I think it's a really great value. I think it's the best Mac for most people to buy. Um, if we had to pick one, this would be it. Uh, and then the M2 is there and is still great if that is what uh, is good enough for you. Uh, a few little quirks, the uh, resolution wise, the uh, one of them gets more more pixels than the other essentially so there's a more space mode on the extended display that is going to be a little bit uh is going to be accessible but not on the main display which is using the same uh video subsystem that was using the laptop display it's a little quirk just a little quirk just thought i would mention it but generally (laughs) if you're one of those people who are like i have an intel macbook air set up with two external displays and i can't update to apple silicon you can now um, because I can tell you it works great, uh, with the lid closed, you got to close the lid. And I had people ask me what happens, how does that, how does that dance work? And the answer is if you plug in two displays and the lid is open, one of the displays does not light up. It just is like, I don't know what that is. And then you close it and boop, it pops open and that becomes your main display. Um, because it's thinking it's using, it's literally taking the main display and transferring it over there. And that's how it thinks of it. But uh, for fans of two displays, 
uh, it's great. And it's a MacBook Air and it's an M3. Like, again, it's what, 16% in some of the my speed tests faster. Again, incremental progress. If you've got an M1 MacBook Air, I know it's sad it got discontinued, but still a great computer. And if you've been holding out on Intel, what are you waiting for? Uh, M2 at $999 and uh, M3 at various prices. It, uh, they are beautiful. And the 15, if you want a bigger laptop, you don't have to buy a $2,000 uh, MacBook Pro, you can you can buy a 15 inch Air. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about the MacBook Air, but um, please share. Um, I've got them here. I've got all of them here. They're all here. I do. I do have a question. Like yes, I've sir. never, uh, I've never run uh, my MacBook closed uh, attached to an external display. Do you have problems with thermal throttling, particularly because like the the Air doesn't have a fan built into it? Uh, the vents on the back, so it should still be fine. Um, okay. I didn't like kill the CPU to see, but generally um, the air is going to get warm if you really hit it hard, but there's still air circulation in there. It's going to be okay. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually a great lifestyle. I used to live that lifestyle of running a, sure. uh, a MacBook Air lid closed on an external display. And uh, every now and then, if you're a primary laptop connected to display as person, a desktop laptopper, um, you will find that you need to pull out the display, the laptop and open it because certain things, it, you know, it's going to say, oh, I need you to, it, it doesn't say that it, it sort of doesn't do anything. And you're like, hmm, maybe I need to open the display. And then sure enough, there's a thing you have to click to say, okay. Occasionally I have, <laughs> I find that I have to actually pull the laptop out and open it up and do something. But for the most part, it just runs and you don't even know that you're not using a desktop Mac on an external display. Um, by the way, uh, something going around that was really interesting. And a guy named Hector Martin posted about this on Mastodon. Uh, he, Hector Martin does Asahi Linux, which is trying to bring Linux to Apple Silicon. It's a very cool project. Um, nice. And he said that some of the changes from M1 to M2 actually uh, set us down this path where the original Mac Mini on M1 could only run that second monitor on HDMI. On the M2, they changed that. And the idea here is they're changing the way that the displays are controlled so that theoretically you can put that second display uh, and do what the M3 MacBook Air does. Now, there's been a lot of people are not sure about whether this means that the M2 MacBook Airs could have done this, but were for some reason not uh, enabled. And uh, we now know that this firmware is going to be updated on the M2 MacBook Pro to support this as well or M3 MacBook Pro to support this. My my take on this is, is don't get too excited by the conspiracies. I think that if Apple had made this functional in a level that they liked, they would have done it and extolled its virtues as an M2 feature. I think they were doing some either some incremental work where they're like, okay, step two is we change this, and then step three, we need to change a bunch of the software, and we'll do that in the M3. Or another, I think, strong possibility is they thought they had it figured out, <laughs> and they tested it in the M2 and they're like, mm, it's glitchy. It's weird. It doesn't work up to our standards as Apple. And so let's just not do it. And so that they never did it. But I am, I am positive that if Apple could have extolled the virtue of this feature in the M2 generation, they would have. I don't think they just didn't get around to writing the firmware for a year and a half. I don't think that's the case. But anyway, it is a conversation that people are having out there. But I, I think, I think a lot of times people ascribe a conspiracy to Apple, uh, where they are withholding features from new, uh, from older hardware that's enabled on new hardware. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, what's actually happening is that they tried it and they're like, oh. Hmm. No. And then they just turn that feature off on whole old hardware. I'm, I, sometimes they do yeah. withhold features from old hardware. It is true, but sometimes, uh, and it's impossible to tell the difference from the outside, unfortunately. Yeah. That reminds me of the story that I thought was kind of interesting that not, not that we're ever recommending people buy like the base model of anything, unless this is all you can afford and it's good for your, good, for, good for your uses. But apparently uh, the, uh, one of the complaints about the previous MacBook air was that if you buy the, two, the, the 256 gig storage mo uh, version of it, it's like super, super slow because right. they were only using, they were only using one, one 256 gig storage chip. Apparently according to a teardown, a whole bunch of other reports with this new model, they are using actually two 128 gig chips. So you get two 
different channels, so it's actually much much faster. And yes. this, is, this is another this is another area where I really wish that uh, Apple engineers were more loose lipped because I would love to have heard the conversation about whether it really was. Look, it won't cost us that much more to do it this way. It'll be a faster product for our entry level users, or whether it was just simply that it will cost us less money if we populate two spots on this board than if we have one line that does one one uh, one spot and another line that does two spots. But I'm, I'm glad that people got a free feature that they, even the people who are in the cheap seats are getting a better view. And, and I, I want to give a thumbs up to the cheap seats because I know like yeah. all of us and all the people probably who are listening to or watching this show are computer people and they're like very discerning about it. But I will say a base model MacBook Air is great. Could it be better? Sure. You can pay to make it better. But like I know we turn our nose up at eight gigs of RAM and 256 storage and all that. But you know what? It's pretty good, especially for sort of regular people yeah. who are not computer yeah. connoisseurs. It's pretty good. So I, I, I'm with you, Andy. Like, it's a great computer, and I'm glad that they have made it not have another penalty for being the base model, which they did when they were sourcing those 256 chips instead of the paired 128s that they can interleave, which makes them twice as fast. Yeah, the, the, just, just quickly uh, that uh, I, most of us, most users, act, act, myself included, spend almost all their time either clicking web links or pushing the cursor to the right in some way or one app or another. And for that, the base unit of anything is is more than adequate. It's it's just nice to have a little bit of future proofing for sure, uh, so that you won't have to replace the whole deck like in five years if you don't have to. I I do hope this is one of those things Apple takes to heart a bit in realizing that when it makes these choices, they invariably do get picked up by people. People will find right. out that you have <laughs> chips in. Like, rather than, you know, trying to figure, I don't know, just avoid this problem in the whole place, like in the first place. Like, try to have some, like, sort of prescience about, like, are people going to be mad about this? Like, there's things that you're okay with. Like, okay, it's fine if they get mad about this. But, like, you don't want to be mad about things where your pro your product doesn't perform as well as you'd like it to, right? So I think that, you know, hopefully some of this is taking a lesson for the future and right. being like, all right, well, let's let's make choices that are not going to get people distracted from the the exciting news right. that we have a new product. And should, instead, oh, should we buy, what about hidden gotchas? Should we buy 128 gig chips? No, 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 no. We can just put in one 256. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And that no one will know. It's like Gerald, uh, you're you're <laughs> out. You're being transferred. <laughs> it's it's one <laughs> it's chip, Michael. Happen. How much could it cost? Yeah, exactly about about a hundred dollars. <laughs> reference acknowledged. I get that. Uh, you exactly. Yeah. Here's the receipt. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, MacBook Airs are out. I love them. They're great. They're great computers. And I think for most and people, the, if you're looking for a computer, I, MacBook Air, it's it, it's going to be I, a good deal. And I think the only thing that always that um, we have a pretty new one here in the house. And the only thing that, that gets you is the number of ports. <laughs> so if you decide <laughs> sure. you want to like if because there are certain things you want to do, like if you're going to use it for Zoom and you're going to put anything more than the internal camera, which is OK, but not great. Um, the as soon as you you want to have your audio and your video go directly into the computer, you don't want them to go through a hub. Those are the ports. And then you want <laughs> you're Ethernet. Done. So then the, you're out of that one. And then you have your keyboard and you're now out of that one. And now you don't have anything else. And so so that's the thing that we get. Um, the keyboard can share a hub. But the other things you often don't want to share a hub if you want to get the absolute stability out of it. And that's where a lot of us start to look at the pro. Yeah, I absolutely. Do, I will say, as somebody who's owned an Air for years and years and years, I almost never plug anything into it. Like once in a <laughs> while, a drive, but like, yeah. I mean, I have a mini on the desktop, right? And I have a ton of stuff plugged into that. So totally, if it's I, my only laptop, it's probably a different situation. So but, I had right. when one of these weeks when I was in Arizona visiting my mom, and I had the green screen behind me, so that like you totally didn't know that I I was somewhere else, except that people thought, thought my lighting was better. Um, <laughs> the uh, I I forgot to bring my MagSafe cable with me, and I had my camera and my microphone connected, and I did the whole show on battery, and it was right. because I had used the ports, and I did I was it was on me. Because I didn't bring the MagSafe connector. I thought, oh, why will I need that? I can just US, use USB-C. I'm already bringing that cable. That was a mistake. That was my mistake. But it did, <laughs> again, if you're somebody who who really is plugging in a lot of stuff, like what I'm not saying is there aren't reasons to get a MacBook Pro. Of course, there are many. It's just that I think most people don't need those reasons. And it's great that Apple makes such a fun, good, solid system that starts at $999 now with the new design with the M2. Like yeah. it's a, it's a, it's one of the best Macs ever, I think, in terms of value and design. I really love it. So I'm happy yeah. that it exists. I, I think it's a really also, high value. I, I think that my, my particular is, is that my wife asked, is a Mac, is an Air okay? And I said, yeah, sure. That'll be fine for what you're using it for. And I pay for that every day. Like every <laughs> day I pay, I, I have to deal with, I, I'm, I'm working around the two port issue and, and I'm just like, oh, 
But, but to, to, to be fair, like uh, uh, a port scarcity is part of the amazing cultural heritage of the of the of the, uh, In, the, MacBook, of the MacBook Air. Air indeed, re 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 remember the first generation that had 64 gigs of, of storage, which was not a whole lot even for the time and had one count them one USB 2.0 <laughs> port. I, I, I got my I remember it because I, I remember that distinctly because I got my press unit like, oh, wow, this is great. It's like the lightest, most easy to travel with laptop ever. Next week, I'm going to be at this week-long conference in Colorado. I'm just going to, oh, my God, the pain, the pain, the pain. <laughs> Yep. So yeah, maybe it's just it's, again, it's 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 like the Citroen CV2. It's like you know, yes, we could yes, we could put a bigger engine in it, but a tiny, tiny little two-stroke engine that looks like it was made out of bicycle parts. That's part of the cult. That's part of the charm. Of it the is. Beast. It is. We suffer uh, it, in that way in order to generate the love that we feel for it. It's part of yeah. It the is love, part of our shared exactly. cultural heritage as MacBook Air users. Thank you, Andy. Um, I okay. I want to talk about Apple and ads. Because Apple is uh, doing some things involving ads. And you might be saying to yourself, as some of us do, I think on a regular basis, Apple is one of the most profitable and successful companies in the world. Does it need more ads? Does it need to do ads? Do, not, not ads for Apple. Does it need to sell ads in its products? But the fact is that, especially when we talk about Apple TV+, Plus, every other streaming service at this point essentially has an ad tier. And I know, I know. You don't like it. I don't like it either. I don't pay. I pay the extra for the not ad tier because I just don't want to see the ads. But what Netflix found and Netflix is number one is that they were at their existing price points. They were making more money per user from the ad tier than from their premium no ad tier, which led immediately to two things, which is a reinvestment in the ad tier and raising the prices of the premium tier so that they could make that money from those people too. But what the net result is that Netflix, who was famously like, no, 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 we're not going to even do ads, is now really into ads. And then you see companies like Disney. Disney Plus launched famously no ads. They're like, no, 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 it's a beautiful premium experience. Well, guess what? There's a Disney Plus with ads. A Amazon added ads. You, you might say to yourself, I'll just keep this bit going amazon well they're it's more of an ecosystem play really they're not gonna they don't need to put ads in it but it's like wait a second but have you met amazon it's all about the ads and so now prime video customers also get to receive ads and you're saying to yourself well if there's ever going to be a holdout it's apple uh because <laughs> apple is providing a premium product and the answer is apple tv as good i would say as the programming is on apple tv doesn't get viewed by a lot of people and it probably would get more customers if it was cheaper uh, and you could also generate money from those customers with ads. And as uh, Gizmodo uh, wrote a story called Apple TV is probably getting ads yesterday. Um, they have hired a 14 year long ad executive from NBC Universal named Joseph Katie to be beef up its growing video advertising team. If we ever were feeling like uh, it was going to happen. And I think it's great that this headline appeared in Gizmodo yesterday because I want to point out a story I wrote on Macworld in April of 2023 <laughs> headlined why ads on Apple TV Plus are as inevitable as a Ted Lasso spinoff. For all the reasons I just said to you, it's going to happen because it's a way for Apple to increase its revenue and create new customers who don't have to pay or pay as much for Apple TV Plus. And uh, we, don't, we don't have to like it. But I think yeah. that they're not hiring NBC Universal ad executives for kicks. Not, not only that, but it also speaks of Apple's commitment to Apple TV Plus, not just as a, a, a part, to, we, not just as part of, hey, we want to make the uh, the Apple Premium package more valuable by making each component of it more valuable. It's like. If if we can get people to uh, subscribe to interested in soccer who are running Android who are running like other set top boxes, we if if they if we want to make it attractive for them to be able to subscribe to Apple TV Plus as a standalone thing, we have to absolutely absolutely do that. And yeah, and it also shows that uh, once again, again, ad money is really really lucrative. Uh, this is that uh, Apple already has an ad business the uh, the uh, in the App Store and other places. When you what you see are influenced by ads, they're uh, the Apple runs their ad business a lot better than Google and Facebook do and, and Amazon do. But nonetheless, it is an ad platform. And as they as Apple continues to find pressure 
internationally on even selling their biggest cash cow, the, the iPhone, every place where they can, every unit that can make more money without sacrificing Apple's mission should be trying to make more money. And if advertising on uh, on Apple TV Plus is going to do that, it's going to make it's going to make the next crop of Oscar losing uh, Apple features uh, a lot easier to produce. <laughs> Ouch. Well, Ouch. Somewhere Martin Scorsese just winced, but it's okay, Andy. It's okay. <laughs> I, I was, by the way, in Oscars, I thought it was really funny that Jodie Foster said, I really like streaming. I really like streaming. I really like streaming. Like she said it like three times in one in one interview. And I was like, somebody is ready to do, <laughs> want someone to hire her for more streaming. Yeah. So but anyway, but project. That someone, yeah, someone you. really is into that. But the, um, uh, you know, one of the things also, it, it scales up with usage. When we look at, for instance, Netflix is a good example. Um, there, you know, in some of those shows, if you watch the macro blocking on the show, I mean, you can see every block because it's being compressed so heavily. And one of the reasons for that is that every user watching costs them money. You know, like it, it costs money to deliver that video to the person. When they pay $8 a month or $12 a month or $19 a month, it, let's just say every hour costs them, it costs Netflix eight cents. You know, let's just, I don't know what the number is, but let's just say it's eight cents or the, you know, two hour movie might cost uh, 20 cents, you know, or two and a half hour movie might cost you 20 cents to, to deliver that to you. Now, if I'm only going to get $15 from you, how many things, how many of those things do you watch before I stop making money? Especially if I'm, cause I'm paying back other things. I've got other investments. It's not just like it can be up to $15. It can be up to like five for that transfer or whatever. And I'm, and I am now that's getting spread out. Now, if I'm, if you're with advertising, if I make, if you cost me 16 cents and I make 17 cents, then that's a much more scalable model when it comes to the total number of viewers. And so, so as you start to want to go wider, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting that cost to work out that cost works out way better uh, as long as you can make an incremental increase in 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 value um and so i think that that's going to be uh, i think that's part of it and i do think it will widen the widen the market as long as apple doesn't take away i think i'm fine with it as long as they don't take away the ability to pay our way out because i haven't seen ads in so long i think decades. i think the, <laughs> one of the <laughs> reasons these things were, up, one of the reasons it's like, 10 dollars a month now is probably that they know there's going to be a 5 dollar a month ad plan right i think that's probably <laughs> the yeah. other shoe well, dropping and, and there. The, these companies are going to like you know you're large enough you're going to get paid either way right and and preferably twice that's that's your goal with this yeah. right like when amazon added ads and there's like oh you pay a little bit extra you can stay ad free it's like well we win either way cuz either you watch the thing with ads and we get paid from the ads or you give us more money in which case we get more money it's kind of like Apple's EU business terms where it's like, you can leave the app store, but you're going to pay us that core technology fee because we're going to get our money one way or the other. At the end of the day, that's what's going to, you know, that's what's driving them. And I think, you know, to Andy's point, uh, Apple has made really good strides with Apple TV Plus of trying to make it available in as many places as possible because it knows that as a service, it has to succeed that way. That's why it's on uh, smart TVs and other set-top boxes and all these third-party places, right? The old Apple probably would have been like, oh, it's on our stuff. you got to buy an Apple TV or a Mac or an <laughs> iPhone to watch it. No, they don't want that. They are selling services. They want it to be available by the broadest number of people possible. And to that end, if you're going to lower the price and add ads or you need to introduce an ad uh, free tier that's at a higher cost, like all of that serves to bringing in more revenue and expanding the market ship. So I think, you know, it's, it's only a matter of time. That's where we are now. It is a little galling. I think both ways because it does smack a little bit of being caught in that, you know, in that corner by these companies where it's like, well, I'm, I'm paying you, but I'm also seeing ads. Like I, I kind of hate that. Right. Like I, you know, I feel like there used to be an agreement that you would, you know, public broadcast television, it's free, but you watch ads in exchange. And, and you know, and you do, that hasn't they, been the deal for a long time, but it's still galls a bit. The, I think that the, the, I think it, they have to be, Apple does have to be careful because they make so much money on so many other things. In that I know that for me, for some reason, and I don't know what it was because it was only $3, but the Amazon, when Amazon yeah. said there was something about that $3 that made me so angry yep. that like, I was like, I'm already paying prime. I'm paying not an insignificant amount for prime. And I get that it's packaged with a bunch of other things, but it's mostly there for you, for me to buy more things from you anyway. And I... This three ninety. I don't know why it was so insulting. Well, they that didn't I add an from, ad from, exactly. below yeah, service right? to. Yeah. Yeah. I hate Prime. Like I, you know, like I, I, I literally went from from loving Prime, like Prime is like my second favorite thing, to the heck with those guys. You know, and 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 it's not like I don't watch them, but I watch them kind of begrudging. I and I paid the three dollars, you know, because I was like, I don't want to watch ads. Um, but but I I I paid the three dollars a month, but I'm I'm still, you know, and I think that Apple, this is the risky part of what they're doing is. 
They're already making a bunch of money and then they're selling us this thing. It, I think it would be easier for them to charge us more than if they turn those ads on and say, okay, now you got to pay another $3 a month to, to get rid of them. Well, I think that's you know, why they raise the price first instead of, of rolling yeah, everybody yeah. to the ad plan is I think that they want to actually, yeah. which is the right thing to do is to say, okay, here, you, you if you're not on the plan, like Netflix, I think did this too. You, you're on the, the no ad plan. The no ad plan is the plan, which I think is a better way to do it. And it's not what Amazon did. And then you come underneath and, and Netflix has shown great success in getting people who previously might've canceled Netflix to instead downgrade to the ad plan and keep Netflix. So you get a a little bit of retention in there and you're reaching maybe an audience that wouldn't have gone without angering. Like I, I the last thing I want to do is somebody who is used to not seeing ads on a platform is suddenly see ads, right? Like it, that's yeah. the worst. Especially when you're playing, but paying I'm, for it. I, but I'm not offended. Yeah, and I know, but I mean, it's true. Like magazines and newspapers we used to pay for and they have ads in them, but something about TV uh, in the, in the era of TiVo and then streaming, we have, we have, we have reached that point where, where we get frustrated. I, yeah. I totally, I totally get it. But I, I, I think that what we've seen is there is definitely success and everybody else is doing it because it's successful to broaden your audience by offering a cheaper plan that has ads in it. Cause some people don't care yeah. and they're happy to save the money and bless them. That's great. But uh, not for me, but it's great. Also, also Apple's in an interesting position with it, with Apple TV plus and Apple music. They don't enjoy any of their usual advantages of anything else they do. Like if they, when they, when they create some of the, the, they can create an, a superlative experience on the iPhone, the iPad, and uh, and uh, the Apple Vision Pro and the Apple Watch because they build the entire thing from start to finish. They build it to synchronize very, very well. They can make sure that the APIs for the apps that are run that run there make things as professional, as wonderful, and as easy and attractive as possible for the user. However, Apple Music on an iPhone really runs absolutely no differently than it does on an Android phone. Apple TV plus on a, uh, on an Apple TV box runs. Okay. The screen quality is better, but not to the extent that anybody who's running like a five-year-old 1040, uh, a typical TV is going to notice it's the exact same experience. So they, this is one, they're, they're, they're two of the businesses that have to absolutely compete on almost the same commercial footing as any of their competitors. And that's where like the Nick, and diming happens because the nickels are really, really important. The dimes are doubly as important as the nickels. <laughs> That's true. Dimes are roughly twice as important as nickels, I found. Um, I'm not an economist. I however, mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Independent labs have could determined be. that. Could be. We, there's so much going on, but, you know, we've also been talking for a very long time. So I am going to bring in our good friend, Leo, uh, from the past, haunting us here in the present. Uh, one more time. Everybody ready your picks of the week because we'll do that when we come back right after this. Leo. Hey guys, I just wanted to step in, if you will, to tell, about, tell you about a great app I've found for my Apple Watch called StepDog. I'm using it right now on vacation to keep track of my steps. StepDog, brought to you by DC Labs, is an Apple Watch app, a virtual pet. Now, it says dog. But And they've got lots of dogs, but I'm using it as a cat. Sammy, our black and white cat, walks with me everywhere. It's a virtual pet that lives in your Apple Watch face and helps you track your steps. Your stepdog moves around with you throughout the day. And, you know, it's cute. does little cute things depending on what's up. It falls asleep once you hit the, the step goal that you set. They have a little food bowl. It's so much fun. The app is free. But I paid the 99 cents a month because I wanted to choose from over 30 dog breeds and cats Labradors, Huskies, German Shepherds, all kinds of cats. You can even name your stepdog. I've, of course, named uh, mine after our kitty, Samantha. This upgrade includes weather forecasts for dog walks. And I love this. It really inspires me to get out there walking. A leaderboard to compete with nearby stepdog users or friends, if you want, with the most steps. Awarding gold, silver, and bronze medals. Download Stepdog. S-T-E-P-D-O-G. You'll find it in the App Store, and it's free right now. All right, back to you, Jason. I'm going to go take a walk with my kitty cat. Oh, okay. Leo is going to walk his cat. That's interesting. Picks of the week time. Let's have the newbie go. Dan oh. Morin, do you have a pick for us to add to the illustrious selection of MacBreak Weekly picks? Yeah, well, I'm in, I'll throw this one out here because maybe I'm the last person in the world to get to it. Um Baldur's Gate 3, which was a game that came out last year on a variety of different platforms, including the Mac. 
um, is a game that I started playing in January. I don't even remember now. Um, I've been playing it on my PlayStation 5 with my wife. Uh, and uh, we've been playing split screen, which is kind of a lot of fun. Uh, and I looked last night when we hit our save point, and it's like 70 hours or something. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, I have been enjoying this game a lot. Uh, it's basically a, uh, you know, it's it's an RPG. It's Dungeons and Dragons. It's based on Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it is very, very in-depth, like tons of content, tons of different storylines, subplots, all this stuff. Um, I have enjoyed this game immensely. Uh, it's got a lot of like character stuff, a lot of like dialogue options. If you like sort of some of the, um, you know, Bioware style style RPGs like Mass Effect or something like that, you will really enjoy this. But it's also got like classic D&D combat in it. You can spend a million hours creating your characters with all these different options. Um, it's just a lot of fun. I've really been enjoying it it's to the point where like I have had so many TV shows that I want to watch that have fallen off, like because my wife, we get, she's like, oh, I just want to play Baldur's Gate tonight. It's like, all right, fine, we'll sit down on the couch, we'll play Baldur's Gate for a couple hours, and that's it. Um, so I, I think it's a lot of fun. Unsurprisingly, it was on a lot of the best of 2023 game lists last year. Um, you know, it was much anticipated, uh, and I think it's it's great. Honestly, I've really, really enjoyed playing it. Darn it, Dan, you're going to cost me like 80 hours of my life now because I've won. <laughs> it really is a time sink. Let me tell you. I, you know, I, I actually think I just didn't pay attention and assumed it didn't, it didn't come out on the Mac. So now I'm ruined. Yeah. I'm completely ruined. Oh no. Oh no. What have you done? Well, thank you. That's an excellent pick other than that it's ruined my life. Andy, do you have a pick for me? Uh, yes, uh, a pick and a half. Uh, I'm a big fan of the of the uh, Panic Playdate. Uh, is the only game platform that I actually use. Uh, I pre-ordered it. I had to wait like a year and a half because, as we know, like it, it it sold every time they come out the new wave of uh, manufacturing. They would just have to like say, okay, you're in the wave three, you're in wave four, the the forty thousand, the next forty thousand, the next ten thousand, next ten thousand. Uh, I'm happy to say that now, if you can actually, you can actually order <laughs> go to play date order it for two hundred dollars and get it like it'll ship in two days they are now absolutely caught up i would say that uh, definitely spend extra twenty dollars for the cover because the screen is like i don't know I, it's the sort of thing you've actually it's small enough and light enough and friendly enough that you actually do want to like carry it around with you and just stick it as part of your uh, daily carry and you want to protect that screen a beautiful experience very very happy with it now they the specific pick is actually underscores the reasons why i had faith in someone who doesn't again who has never owned a game a con, a game platform before, never owned a game console, decided to risk at the time $180 on something that was unproven. I was hoping that because it was panic, it would be not just, oh, look, it's another like Nintendo emulator. Oh, look, it's another set of like very, very basic, like simple games. There are other platforms that do that sort of thing much better for much less money i want like the weirdos to come up with weird games that are just intriguing just on the concept of them and today was a drop date for a very eagerly anticipated uh, playdate game uh, called mars after midnight uh, and like, well, what it's, well, it, well, it happens on Mars and you're dealing with all kinds of aliens like, oh, wow, so you have to like go hunting aliens and go shooting. No, uh, you are the night manager of a community center <laughs> and from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. All the aliens like come in for their like group meetings, like again, their anger management, <laughs> well, the, 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 their version of AA. It's your job to make sure they have enough meeting rooms and make sure like the donut table and the coffee tables are are stocked and that no Nobody's getting in who doesn't have permission to get in. And it is like, I am so into this. <laughs> it is, it's weird. I have, I've, only, I've only installed it today because once again, it just dropped today. For $6, I'm willing to have a good amount of fun. If it's a kind of a puzzle game, I get the impression from like the, the devlog and stuff like that. It's definitely not a shoot 'em up, but it's going to be several hours of very, very odd adventure. Uh, the person who wrote this, uh, you, you buy his stuff on Reputation. His name is uh, Leslie Pope. His previous, one of his previous hits was called Papers, Please in which all you do is like your your passport border control and people come to your station and present their papers and you either admit them or don't admit them based on all kinds of stuff and it's like wow this is so totally not mario kart that's great as great as it is that's i i would have bought a switch if i wanted like a mario kart sort of experience so yeah uh i, I will also end this by saying that I also had a great amount of faith that because it was Panic Software who was creating this, it would both attract uh, uh, enough really 
nice, weird developers, but also that within a year's time, it wouldn't be just the 20 free games you get with it that they uh, that they bankrolled. There is actually a very interesting library of 400 to 500 games. Some of them are very, very simple and very, very familiar. And yes, there are, there are Nintendo emulators for it, at least until Nintendo starts to <laughs> brings the Sue hammer to, uh, to, to that attention as well. Uh, but yeah, it, is a very, it was a good investment for me. I'm still enjoying it. Uh, and it usually stays charged. There's, it's very, it doesn't stay in, in a drawer for very, very long. I love the play date. And they are, for people who are skeptical about the platform, there are so many games for the play date now. It yeah. is, they, they added the catalog, which is like their app store. You can also sideload though. It's not a restrictive app store like Apple's and the catalog alone. It's, it's amazing. Plus it comes with 20 games. So, and they're available yeah. now. So if you were one of those people who was like, I don't want to wait two, two years for it. I believe you can just roll right up and buy one now. Also, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. To Andy's suggestion, Lucas Pope's other game, Return of the Obra Dinn, which yeah. I think is available on the Mac. That game is awesome. That is one of the best games I've played in the last five years. Yeah, love it. And, and, and one very last note: now that it's been out for in, in, for a couple of years now, the first wave of games was going to be good, but the developers will would not have figured out the tricks to make games work really, really well on this platform. Now you're actually getting pseudo 3D racing games on it because developers have figured out here is how, oh, okay, that I wasn't getting the frame rate I wanted because I was doing it this way. I should try this way. And other frameworks and platforms have been created for it. It's a very vibrant uh, system. So again, it's, it's not going to be for everybody, but if it, you think it's for you, please don't be dissuaded by the idea that, oh, well, I'm only going to get 20 games. They're not going to be very good. This is a very, this is one of the, this is this, this was a very, very good investment in short time, waiting for buses, waiting for trains, waiting for planes. Pleasure for me. Nice. All right, Alex, your turn. What do you have? So I'm picking a uh, Topaz Photo AI. I think I talked about Video AI the last time on, but I, I needed I needed to up, upgrade my um, I needed to upgrade something. You know, we were doing a show. And I needed to get an image and I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> impressed. I was like, I don't even know how it does this. So, so if you look at, uh, if here's a, here's an example here of this droid that I did in uh, mid journey, um, this is my safe image. And anyway, but so obviously on the right, but I can start to zoom in. And, and as I start getting closer, of course you have, you can start to see it make the correction there. And we're really, you know, as we get closer, so this is the this is the scaled up version, and I have to admit I've been scaling up images for a very long time, and to see something with this kind of detail get reproduced, I mean, it is definitely um, at a level, and this is this is a little harder because it's not it doesn't have a, a human face, which it does activate. It does look for human faces to try to improve them, um, but but when you look at this kind of you know when we get up to the you know the actual um, you know really getting in there there's not a lot of other things that would be able to really, you know, achieve those ed edges. And if we look at another one, I was grabbing a couple of things. Here's a ship here. You can see it here. This was, this was actually a heritage. Uh, oh, was it true port scarcity? <laughs> I went ahead and put it into, into, in, and got this, but you can start to see, I mean, when you start to zoom in here, just what is just pixels here becomes something that, you know, looks a lot more realistic as you, as you start to, as you start to pull back here. Um, you can see a lot of the a lot of the benefits here. Here's another one that I did from Mid Journey, which is this is a little cartoon dude be me talking about how much I dislike uh, open mics. Um, so you can see him <laughs> with the mic there and um, our, our little know it all um, that is um, ruining my show. Anyway, so um, the uh, but you can see, look at this all these pixel this pixelation here and something that just looks nice and clean. You know, as you start to go through that. Uh, I have to say that I've never seen anything sharpen or, or enlarge photos 4X as well, you know? And, yeah. and so, and again, I put it off because they don't have a demo. So you have to pay $200. They say they'll give you no, no questions asked, give you the money back in 30 days if you don't like it. Um, so they're, they're, uh, so I was like, I put it off and put it off and put it off and finally bought it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I, I 100% endorse this. Uh, and you, you can download it. You can get the full use of the app. You just can't actually save. Uh, so maybe you can, but while, while I'm, yeah, while you're saving, I didn't even know no, that. You, yeah. I would have bought you, it anyway. Well, while I, I will give you like, as I, I am legitimately saving up for this app because it's a $200 app. Yeah. 
Yeah. You can, however, screen go into a full full size and then screenshot and then stitch them back <laughs> together. But 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 I'm, but I'm I'm evangelizing this really really hard because I there are a lot of AI imp- upscalers and stuff like that. What's great about Topaz is that it's not you. It's designed to give you full control. It's designed to make a photo look better, not look like AI. So yeah, there's right. uh, if, if for instance one feature of it is oh wow there's there's a human face in there. I know I have AI that knows what a human face should look like. I can synthetically add details based on what I understand about human faces. But if you think the results look a little bit faky, you can either slide, push a slider and back it off a bit or just turn that off entirely. Uh, and so I've, I've uh, I've been going, it's been encouraging me to go through like old photos. Like I have a photo, I've, I, I, I got a tour of the, uh, of the Letterman show. And of course I got my picture taken behind Letterman's desk. And uh, it was taken with, a, in 2006, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, 2008, with a camera with a sensor that was really old to begin with. And then to make things worse, I know I've got the original somewhere, but all I could find was the 800 by 600 downscaled version that was on Google Photos. And it was able to very, very quickly turn it into a very convincing uh, 16 megapixel image that was uh, with all the noise is absolutely gone. Denoise is almost flawless. Like it's just really, really perfect. It's I, I can't recommend this enough. The fact that a cheapskate like me is saving up two hundred dollars to to buy this, uh, it's it underscores the reason why years ago when I was buying my first really big investment pro uh, camera hardware, and I was thinking, do I go with full frame Sony or do I go with uh, Micro Four Thirds? Which I love everything about it, but if you do shot. pixel peeping, it's just it's a it's a small it's a smaller sensor, so the noise is going to be a lot worse. I had faith that denoising software would be much better in the future, and this is the app that I was waiting for. It's like there is, I do not regret that 100%. So again, I will be buying this uh, very, very soon. Uh, and I will, st- I feel so guilty about like occasionally doing stuff like this by saying, oh, well, if I take like 18 screenshots and then dump them into Photoshop to stitch them together, I can have the original back. <laughs> I, I will be paying for this. But again, 100 percent again for, if you've been taking pictures since like the iphone one two one and one three three s you can suddenly have like iphone uh f- iphone 14 iphone 15 pro level pics uh, generated from these old pictures 100 percent recommendation amazing thank you alex that's a great one mm-hmm. well that does it we reached the end we've accomplished a lot i think we've learned a lot we think we've grown together we've definitely shared our uh, macbook air heritage and uh, gotten that out there there'll be a uh, there'll be a spaghetti feed later for all the members of the macbook air heritage club um we it's been a privilege to host i will be doing this privilege again next week because leah was gone for two count them two tuesdays um and we'll have a different special guest but i want to thank dan morin for being my special guest this time dan thank you tell people where they can find you Sure. Uh, you can find me on most social media as at D Warren. I'm D Warren at Zeppelin Flights on Mastodon. I'm also on Blue Sky and Threads and all that good stuff. But my website, dmorin.com, is a place to find everything I do, including the numerous podcasts, including technology shows, Clockwise and The Rebound, as well as my many novels. My most recent novel is All Souls Lost, which is a supernatural detective story set in Boston, where I live, uh, that may involve some shady goings on at a big technology company, yes. ah, which little, could be of interest. Little Apple-like <laughs> angle there, but no spoilers. It's, it's yes. could be spoilers. maybe a little bit, maybe a little a little bit and of course dan is my uh is my uh co-author at sixcolors.com so you can check him out there too but yeah buy his book buy his books do it please do do it please and all souls lost is not part of a like you don't have to read a trilogy or a quadrilogy or something yeah. it's just a it's, a, a, it's, it's a, what we used to call a book it just stands <laughs> on its own you can read it a book. It's fun. a book how catchy book uh thank you for being here again dan uh andy inako pleasure as always i got to see you from in the big studio this time and i guess leo asks you when you're going to be on wgbh next so let's do that uh i was on last week so i'm off this week's but you can go listen to the previous show go to, go to wgbhnews.org uh and for other my stuff go to just uh type and not go into almost any uh almost any social media platform less twitter than 
used to be, but I H N A T K O. That's the that's the shibboleth you give. It's you have to prove that you're interested in my stuff by being able to spell my last name correctly. Yes, but, but you're the only one essentially. So there's that. It's ease of use once you get the spelling right. I learned this lesson a Mostly. long. I don't want to say how long ago how to spell Andy's mm-hmm. last name, but it was a long time. My, ago my cousin, my, well, although, although my cousin is a famous like economist in in Australia, so we often we often exchange like misrouted emails or people are saying, "Wow, are are you related to the famous economist?" Like I was a student. Like oh wow, hey hey Tate, I got this updated. So, nice. Yeah. I I got an email the other day that said, "Jason, it's so great to see you doing podcasts and stuff." I sold a deck, uh, like a VMS system to you in the early eighties. And I was like, (laughs) that wasn't me. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. I know I got gray hair, but I'm younger than that. Uh, but anyway, it was very sweet because there, I guess there's some Jason Snells out there too. It's, it happens. The, the, the nice, the nice thing about a name like an Otco, there are some of us out there, but we all know that if there's a good chance for your blood and tissue type compatible, if push came to shove. So (laughs) <laughs> a good Google search will probably find a kidney out there for me. And and we know you have many Alex Lindsay's to choose from, but we appreciate you choosing <laughs> ours. Alex, thank you for being here where people can find you. Yeah. Um, in office hours, Doc global, of course, uh, we're going to talk about, we talked about memo composer, memo composer, memo live, of course, by Boeing software, but they have a composer, which is replacing quartz composer um, uh, because they needed it. And so they've been rebuilding it from scratch and you can actually import quartz. So they, they gave us a little preview of that today. I was talking about Radio Plays tomorrow with uh, David Osman um, from, uh, yeah, so it's, um, how those things get put together. Um, and then, we're, then we go into like looking at, um, uh, you know, like the, we're going to look at the Oscars and figure out like, what do we like? What do we not like? We, we'll do th- geeky things like notice that all of the red carpets, except for the main red carpet, were on wired mics and ours are on, and then the main main one is all on wireless. <laughs> like oh somebody didn't someone said we're not going to give you wireless um and so so if you really want to go the deep broadcast geeky thing that'll be on thursday um on graymatter.show uh with michael krasny uh, we've got um uh we've got uh, andrew Fracknoy on he is one of the world experts on the eclipse yeah. so as we get closer and closer to the eclipse andrew's going to come on so if you're interested in that check that out graymatter.show uh, it should be a great podcast that'll come out next week, but we do it live on Fridays. And if you follow me on Twitter, I'll put out the link and you can uh, watch it live. Excellent. Yeah, the eclipse is coming. The moon, next time it uh, gets to a new moon, it's going to cover the sun. It's it going to happen. It's going to be exciting. I, yeah, I know we've talked about this before on the show. If you are anywhere near or I'm driving all the way there, <laughs> like I'm going there with my family. We're going to go look. We're going to go watch it. Uh, it is, if you've never seen the eclipse, it is a thing. Like yes. It's not like it's a total, total, oh, kind of cool. Total solar eclipse is not like a partial solar eclipse. It is a completely no. different beast. And this is your last time to see it in North America in a very long time. It starts 20 years down in Mexico, goes through Texas, up through the Midwest to Cleveland, across the Great Lakes, ends up in Maine. Go see it if you can you go to totality. It. Go to totality. Yeah. Bring your glasses with you because they're they're the parts before and after totality too. Get some eclipse glasses, maybe at your local library or something. But uh, you got to go for totality. You must. I, I agree. Absolutely. And that brings us to the end. But uh, like I said, I'll be back hosting for Leo next week with uh, with the usual gang plus one a special bonus guest. Uh, but until then, I'm sad that I have to tell you, you have to get back to work because break time is over. Bye, everybody. Bye.